Hello, my name is Claire Michkowski and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan an SAB sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAC receive great opportunities to network with their special guests. If you're a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoyed today's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of today's presentation will be available on our website soon. We'd like to encourage each of you to consider becoming friends of the Dole Institute. Our friends help keep our programs free and open and support archive research and our student activities. Please contact us if you are interested. Before we begin today, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the presentation, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rich Barbuto. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last of our 10 presentations in the Military Innovations Lecture Series conducted by the Department of Military History of the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. We have been particularly proud of our continuing relationship with the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics that sponsors these lecture series. I'd like to take a moment now to speak about our series for next year, which will kick off in February. 10 lectures, each given by a uh, military historian, to speak about the book he wrote, what motivated him, what challenges uh, he met along the way. Uh, every writer has stories. Uh, and then getting the book published, as well as content of the book itself. So I think it'll be fairly interesting. It's going to run the entire gamut of military history. However, today's presentation is the Manhattan Project and is given by Professor Sean Kalick. Sean Kalick is a historian of the Cold War. He has a BA in political science and international studies from the University of Denver, an MS in defense and strategic studies from Missouri State University, an MA in history from Youngstown State University, and a PhD in history from Kansas State University. He is a professor in the Department of Military History where he has taught since 2004. He is also our master instructor charged with oversight of 30 instructors and the entire military history curriculum. Professor Kalick lectures and publishes widely on topics such as transnational terrorism, the Cold War, post-Cold War security environment. His publications include Combating a Modern Hydra, Al-Qaeda and the Global War on Terrorism, Thinking About War, past, present, and future, and U.S. Presidents and the Militarization of Space. Dr. Kalick currently has two books under contract. The first is entitled Spies, the Russian and U.S. Espionage Game from the Cold War to the 21st Century. And the second is The Russian Revolution and Russian Civil War, an Essential Reference. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Sean Kalick and the Manhattan Project. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm a fool for accepting two books at one time, but we'll go from there, right? Today what I want to do is talk about the Manhattan Project, kind of the background to the project, uh, what was going on prior to 1938. We won't cover too much of. So essentially the story is going to start in 1938 and take us up till the dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the problem I have is we have about 40 minutes to cover a lot of material. Anybody here read Richard Rhodes' Making the Atomic Bomb, which is a big, thick Pulitzer Prize winning book? The idea is to condense that into 40 minutes, which is kind of hard to do. So we'll kind of hit the wave tops. If you have deep questions as we go through, please ask them. Um, we'll go from there, okay? All right, let's start in 1938, because we could start back with Madame Curie and discovery of atomic atoms and all that fun stuff. But I think if we want to talk about what, what spurs the Manhattan Project and what, what leads the United States to help develop the atomic bomb, Really, we need to start in 1938 with these three people. We have Otto Hahn, Fritz Strassmann, and then in the center, this is 
Strauss in there, and then Hahn there as well, is Lisa Mittner. Anybody know what they do in 1938? Nobody? Anybody, any chemists in the room? Because I'm not one, by the way. They figure out that you can split an atom, which is pretty significant. And this is done kind of in, in theoretical research. They're, they're in Berlin at the uh, Wilhelm Kaiser Institute for Chemistry. They've been working on atomic particles. And they figured out that if you bombard a neutron or a, uh, an atom of uranium-235 with a neutron, you can separate it and split it, and it becomes barium and krypton. Brilliant, right? Revolutionary. No, you guys need to help me here, all right? <laughs> Not so much, but this idea of when you split the atom, it becomes two smaller atomic particles. The idea is that when you split it, guess what happens? An explosion, energy, right? A significant amount of energy happens. So these guys are pretty proud of the product. It uh, is in December 1938. It's going to go out through the world through uh, various uh, scientific journals. The problem is, is who's in power in 1938 in Germany? Who's running Germany? Yeah, Mr. Hitler and his NSDAP are the Nazis, right? The problem is that Lisa Mittner here is Jewish. So she's been working with Otto Hahn from about 1933 on. So by the time they get to 1938, she's no longer part of the equation because she's left Germany due to uh, the anti-Jewish laws being enacted by the Nazis. So she's out of the equation, unfortunately, but I think she deserves significant credit because she's a chemist, by the way, who spends lots of time with Hahn, who's a physicist, as a Strassman. So she's kind of written out of some of the history, by the way, but the fact that she does some groundbreaking, groundbreaking chemistry prior to 38 is pretty significant, so I thought she deserved a, a position up there. Okay, so you have these two gentlemen who's going to come up with this fantastic idea, and this, this explosion right here, this idea that you have a source of energy that can be tapped is going to be the consternation of lots of physicists, chemists, and theoretical scientists from 38 on, because the idea is if, it's, if Hitler is in power, do we really want Germany to have this cutting-edge research? Do we really want to consider that Germany can build an atomic bomb? Anybody want to guess what the answer is? No. Not only no, but no, right? Here's the international concern. Again, you can see what's going on in 1938. You have the Nuremberg rallies. Uh, the, the Nazis are getting significant power in Germany. Uh, there's some designs on 3940 in Austria, the Sudetenland. So they're expanding. By 1939, they're going to roll into Poland. 1940, they're going to roll into France. So there's an idea here that there's nefarious deeds going on with just it's not just theoretical research that can be used for something uh, more detrimental. Enter Leo Szilard, who is Hungarian by birth. He spends lots of time in Germany in the interwar period, specifically over the 1920s, working under Albert Einstein in the University of Berlin. Einstein, as we all know, is going to leave Germany because of the Nazis as well, he comes to the United States. And Szilard is deeply concerned about the research that Hahn and Strassmann are doing because the idea that can be used to make a bomb. Szilard, who is a physicist himself, has been working on the idea that, okay, if we go back one, to do it once is fantastic, right? Szilard is focusing on, can you sustain a chain reaction? So you split, you split the atom, you send a nu neutron through it, and can you maintain that idea time and time again, which you get critical mass. We'll talk about, and again, I'm not the guy to be talking high energy physics here, but I know enough to be dangerous, all right? And he's, he's concerned that if you maintain this, you can actually make the explosion even more significant, more powerful, and you can use it to weaponize and build a bomb. Because this won't get you there with barium and krypton, but if you sustain it and use 238, you can actually come up with something that's more significant and more powerful. So as Szilard is working through his theoretical science, he's going to leave Germany as well in 38, 39. He's going to come to the United States, and he's going to convince Albert Einstein that together they should write a letter to FDR. And they should write a letter to FDR that concerns two points mainly. The first point is this breaking uh, scientific research on uranium and atomic bombs should be explored and should be supported by the US government, which is pretty significant. The second part of the letter is we don't, let, we don't want to let these guys get the bomb first. And Szilard isn't rel relatively well known in the United States, but Albert Einstein is. So Szilard convinces Einstein, hey, how about I write the letter and you put your name on it? <laughs> which is pretty good. Einstein actually says yes. And here's a copy of the letter, which 
this looks much better on the screen. I'm sorry you can't read it. But what it says is essentially is, we've been doing this with Enrico Fermi, who we'll talk about in a little bit, with Leo Szilard, who they're actually working together. Uh, Fermi is Italian, Szilard, as I said, is Hungarian. And they've been working on this chain reaction idea. What Einstein's going to write is that we have this revolutionary technology, that we're, we're on the cutting edge of science, and we believe that this research can be used to make a significant bomb. He talks about the bomb's so big that it's going to have to be put on a barge and floated into a harbor, and if you explode, it's going to wipe out the harbor and probably the city around the harbor. And he makes another point that the problem is it's so heavy and so big and cumbersome that you can never put it in an aircraft just because we don't have the technology to lift it that much. He goes on to say in the second page, the problem is we don't want the Germans to have this because we believe the Germans may be more advanced than we are in the cutting edge research of atomic particles. Anybody want to guess what FDR does with this letter? No, he doesn't throw it in the trash. We're on the verge of war here. This is 1939-1940. No, you don't want to go to Congress. They'll, they'll t debate it for four years, right? And, and the war will be over by then, <laughs> right? You're going to prove it. And you're going to say, okay, I agree with it. After all, this is Albert Einstein, right? You say, can't say no to Albert Einstein. <sighs> you guys are a tough crowd. So what he does is he's going to say, okay, let's support uranium research to see if we can sustain a chain reaction. Say if we can build this chain reaction beyond just a simple splitting of the atom, where you maintain that time after time so you can sustain what they call critical mass. Because at a certain point, if you sustain it, critical mass, it'll all blow up. And you'll have a nice big atomic bomb. Okay? Here's what Szilard's working on, which is, again, what you see in the first one is the split. Set a neutron out of there, split another one, neutron out of there, split another one, neutron out of there, split another one, and you're getting exponentially more power out of it. That's the extent of my high quantum physics right there. And through 39, 40, this is what Szilard, Fermi, and others are working on. In fact, it's going to places like the Naval Research Laboratory, Stanford University, uh, Caltech, and Berkeley, by the way. Uh, Physicists, chemists are all working on this. You also have the University of Chicago. You have Princeton involved. So really, it's being done in the university labs throughout the United States. And again, it's being supported by the US government. So we tend to think of the US government not supporting science and STEM as it's is a big problem. Right? They're doing it back in 1939, 1940, because they're concerned that this technology can be used for bombs, and we don't want the Nazis to get it. All right, the problem becomes, as I mentioned earlier, what happens with Germany in 1939? They go east into Poland and take over Poland. After Poland, what do they follow up with in 1940? Now, Soviet Union is 42, but close. France first and then Soviet Union, right? And what's going on in the Pacific? Yeah, Japan's doing their thing, Pearl Harbor in 1941, December 7th, right? Uh, we're going to have Midway, Guadalcanal in 42. So if you're FDR on these scientists, if you're really concerned in 38, 39 that the Germans are ahead of you and they're moving fast and furious on an atomic bomb, as you see the war expanding and the Japanese expanding across the Pacific and ultimately the Germans expanding and doing a pretty good job in Europe, are you even more concerned now that they're dumping money into all kinds of weapons research? And the answer is yes. So go ahead. No, they, no, what happens is the Germans are going to take Hans and Strassmann's research and try to weaponize it, but Hitler becomes obsessed with tactical management and diffusing his money into all kinds of other programs. And what's interesting is that initial research is, it's in, it's in the scientific journals of the period. So in 38, 39, it's open research. The problem is once Szilard, Einstein, and FDR get behind it, it becomes essentially classified research, at least on the U.S. side. The Germans are doing their thing. They're going to end up with heavy water production is about as far as they get. So the problem is they don't have a nice way to organize everything. So the war is expanding, and this is going to create a, a greater impetus for the scientists, really, to work on solving the technical problems, the scientific problems, the theoretic problems, to weaponize this idea of a chain reaction. Here's the original dream team. And Vannevar Bush is essentially the first scientific advisor to the president. He works significantly for 
FDR. And I'll read off some of his, some of his background. Electrical engineer by, by training. He actually built the first analog computer in the early 20s. So this is pretty significant stuff. He's actually the founder. Anybody own Raytheon stock? In this? <laughs> he, he founds Raytheon. He's, he's a co-founder of the company, which is pretty significant. Uh, in 1938, he's appointed to the NACA, which is the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, which is the predecessor to NASA. They do a lot of high-end, cutting-edge research on aeronautics. He's appointed to that board. From there, he's made chairman of the National Resource Defense Council, which is talking about how do you maximize the resources and science to, uh, to a war effort. And from there, he's going to be put in charge of um, OSRD, which is the Office of Scientific and Research Development, which is how do you use cutting edge technology and research to build weapons. He is the conduit with this dream team. All right, so he's FDR's guy who's going to brief FDR and work with the scientists because FDR doesn't quite get along that well with scientists, but he can get along with, with Bush. So let's go through the dream team. Th these, th these five folks kind of represent a smattering of who's working on this project, by the way. Amongst these five, we're going to have three Nobel Peace Prize winners. No slouch there, right? <laughs> what was that, Mike? Well, uh, hold on, I'll get there. Ho hold on, Mike. All right, we'll have Nobel, Nobel Prize winners. We're going to have one that's nominated twice that doesn't win, and then Oppenheimer, who is ultimately going to be in part of charge of the Manhattan Project. So let's go through some of these guys to find out who they are and what they're doing. We'll start with Arthur Compton, and then we'll move to the left. <coughs> Arthur Compton won, wins the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1927 for working on the scattering of X-rays. And, and again, we don't want to get too deep into the idea, but it's about atomic particles and how they behave after they've been radiated. Uh, the process, as he develops, is going to become known as the Compton Effect, by the way, after uh, Arthur Compton. In 1941, he's head of the National Academy of Science on the Committee to Evaluate Atomic Research for War. He's going to work with Fermi and Szilard, who are going to work on the sustaining the chain reaction and producing that at the, University of Ver at the University of Chicago, the first chain reaction. And then he's ultimately going to oversee the Hanford production facility of plutonium. And again, the first guy, he has his own Nobel, Peace Pri or Nobel Prize, and Fantastic guy. Fermi is the next. He's Italian by birth. He's going to win the Nobel Prize in physics in 1938. He's an expert on neutrons. He's going to leave Rome right after he wins the Nobel Prize in 38 because Mussolini and the fascists are kind of doing their thing, much like the Nazis and Hitler are doing their thing, and he's concerned. So he wins the prize. He figures he might as well leave while the going's good. He's going to come to the United States to benefit, and he's going to sync up with these characters. Because he's also been working with Szilard prior to winning the, uh, the Nobel Prize in physics as well. Leo Szilard, who's really one of the impetus behind this. Again, he's the guy who kind of forces the idea through Einstein and ultimately through FDR that the United States needs to be working on this because we can't allow this technology to fall into, or this research to fall into the German hands. He's going to win the, actually, he's not going to win. He's, gonna, he's the guy who's nominated twice in 47 and 49, first in chemistry and ultimately in physics for his work on chain reactions and ultimately his work with Compton and Szilard. So he's kind of the slouch of the group who's nominated but never wins, and he's nominated after, by the way. But he's going to be significant in the fact that he is one of the impetus behind this. He is a guy who's done the cutting-edge research on how do you sustain the chain reaction to get that critical mass to create the atomic bomb. Next is Robert Oppenheimer, who becomes, the, with uh, Leslie Groves, one of the primary uh, research scientists of the Manhattan Project. Interesting background in Groves, or I'm sorry, in, in Oppenheimer. Uh, his sister's a communist. His brother-in-law is a communist. They're suspect that he's a communist. But it's in the 1920s, you know, 30s, and being a communist is kind of a cool, hip thing to do because the Great Depression's on. So. That's going to come back to haunt him after the war, by the way. And it's going to haunt him kind of during the war, but Leslie Groves is going to kind of overlook that because he has a unique capacity to kind of talk to people like this. Groves is no, or I'm sorry, I keep saying Groves. Oppenheimer is no slouch either. Actually, he does graduate work uh, at Cambridge University at the Cavendish Lab under J.J. Thompson, who wins a Nobel Prize in physics in 1906 because he discovers electrons, by the way. So what you see in these guys is they're all working on cutting-edge science. This is hardcore stuff, right? They're, they're breaking new ground. The last guy is Glenn Seaborg, <laughs> who wins a Nobel Peace Prize late, though. He, he wins, I'm so, I keep saying Peace Prize, sorry, Mike. Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1951. 
And he's going to lead the team that discovers plutonium, and ultimately he's going to be critical in developing that second atomic bomb that we drop on um, Nagasaki, and ultimately the bomb that we test at Trinity in June of 45 is going to be based on plutonium designed by Seaworth. So he is a fundamental character who builds the idea of uranium may not be the way to go. Let's go with plutonium because you can produce it quicker, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so th again, this is a, a smattering of the folks that we're talking about. So, you know, no slouch here, right? And the others that I haven't even mentioned are you have Gor George Kitzenkowski, who's also a, a, a research expert on plutonium. He's going to head up the design bureau with Oppenheimer to build the second bomb. You have Edward Teller, who ultimately becomes a guy who builds the hydrogen bomb. So you have all these, these big scientists who spent really the, the formative years of their youth working on atomic particles. The average age of the scientists working at Los Alamos in 1942-43 is 25 years old. <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel kind of old and like I haven't done much with my life, which is pretty amazing. All right, so these guys are doing the research and pushing it at their respective institutions throughout 39 and 42. 40 is going to become a critical year because, after all, FDR is going to support this program. He's going to initially s give the gov or give what becomes the Manhattan Project about two billion dollars. Now, that's a lot of money in 1942. Two billion dollars, and and we'll do some numbers at the end to show you uh, kind of roughly in this in a more contemporary period. It's about worth 24 million or 24 billion dollars. So we're talking lots of money in 1942. Um, the only other weapons program that costs more money long term during World War II. Anybody want to guess what it is? Yeah, the B-29, the thing that has to drop it, which is kind of ironic. So this is actually cheaper than the airplane that's developed to drop it. Go figure, right? All right. September 7th, 1942 is the official creation of the Manhattan Project. And Leslie Groves, Colonel Leslie Groves is actually put in charge of the Manhattan Project. He's the guy who's going to bring it all together. There's, there's a proto-Manhattan Project prior to that. Groves isn't involved because Groves is in charge of building a little building in Washington, D.C. called the Pentagon. So he's heading up that project. That project's over around the summer of 42. We're nearing an end. Groves is going to be relieved from that, and he's looking for a wartime assignment, right? He wants to go overseas and get in the action. The problem is he's a really good engineer, and the Army Corps of Engineers, they don't want to let him go, so they dangle this carrot in front of him. And Groves says, I really don't want to work with a bunch of eggheads. These guys are all scientists. I believe he has a master's degree, so he kind of has an inferiority complex. <laughs> but they sit down and explain to him, here's the reality. Vannevar Bush explains to him, this is cutting edge research. We're doing something huge here, and we have a lim limited amount of time because we don't know where the Germans are as far as their research. So he says, OK, but if you promote me, there's got to be something in it for him, right? So ultimately, he's going to get a promotion to first one star, then ultimately a two star generalship out of this. And the problem that Groves has is really threefold. He has to acquire all the land and facilities necessary to work on this project. He has to require the people to work on this project. And he has to have a weapon or something that can be used within, I don't know, they, they're thinking three years. So they make the argument that they can have something probably by mid-45, but don't expect it any earlier than mid-45. So if you're Groves, what do you do? This is a bit overwhelming for you because you're used to running the Pentagon, which seems like a pretty easy project compared to building an atomic bomb. And the problem is he doesn't get along well with all these people hanging out in all these you know, radiation labs and you, the Vandian Corporation. We're, we're going to build Los Alamos. We'll talk about that. So he has to hire somebody that can kind of talk to the scientists. And this is where Oppenheimer comes in. Oppenheimer actually has no administrative experience prior to the Manhattan Project. He runs a lab, and he works with the graduate students. And the, I believe the greatest number of graduate students that he controls or manages is something like 16 to 20. So imagine that. You're taking a guy out of a lab who's only kind of managed 16 to 20 students, and you're going to put him in, in charge of this project, which is ultimately going to um, have about 120,000 scientists, chemists, physicists working under him. And he's going to be the guy in, that's in charge of the science side of the house. And Gross picks him because... Oppenheimer has a unique way of explaining complex ideas, which is what they're working on, to Groves. And again, Groves isn't a dumb guy, but he's an engineer, not a scientist. So when you're talking high quantum energy physics, it can be a, get a bit daunting, right? So he wants somebody that can do it and explain it well, and Oppenheimer wins the job, despite the fact that there's suspicion that he may be a communist, and the fact that he's never really managed anything in his life. And to be, to be fair, 
they end up pre being a pretty good team because Groves is a fantastic organizer. It can bring everything together, and is a real kind of act, take action kind of guy. Oppenheimer is really good at managing labs and people. So o over Los Alamos, he's going to do a really good job of kind of letting the scientists kind of run, do their thing, but make sure they're meeting their deadlines and doing what they need to do. The original odd couple, right? <laughs> but they're both really neat. No one's messy. The first thing that Groves has to do is go out and acquire facilities. So Los Alamos, Hanford, which is in Washington, and ultimately Oak Ridge, which is in Tennessee. These are, these are the three main ones. And you can see the money that's being allocated to these facilities. Los Alamos is where you're going to actually do the majority of weaponization and engineering of how do, you take the, how do you take the uranium, how do you take plutonium, and make it into something that's a weapon. Hanford is where we're going to refine plutonium, and Oak Ridge is where we're going to do a lot of the, the uranium development and um, enrichment for the program. Now, it, let's start with Oak Ridge. What's going on in Tennessee in the 1930s? And why does it cost so much money to build Oak Ridge? Yeah, what's Tennessee Valley Authority all about? Electricity. Electricity. And guess what you need to make uranium? Lots and lots and lots and lots of electricity. So you can put all the systems in that you need, but the problem is you're going to have to develop the infrastructure necessary to expand that process. So in many ways, that's why Oak Ridge is so expensive, because you have to build a large number of facilities to enrich the uranium and provide power to it. Los Alamos, you're doing research, so it's not so much uh, infrastructure intensive. And Hanford, is, it, there's some facilities there, but it doesn't, making plutonium doesn't consume as much energy as making uranium. Okay. Hanford's out in Washington State, kind of on the eastern side of the state, kind of lower on the Oregon border. Okay. <coughs> and you can see that some, some money being outlaid. So again, we tend to think about money of the Manhattan Project going into kind of the bomb, the plane, the scientists. You don't think about developing infrastructure because at each one of these facilities, and as we go back to the map, there are going to be facilities all in the United States. You have to build facilities for people, right? So if you have a whole bunch of 25-year-old scientists hanging out with their wives and families, they better have some things to do. So it's not just building facilities in labs. You actually have to build homes, movie theaters, bowling alleys, things like that. Here's a graph that I found on the people being employed. This is contractors' employment. So this doesn't count all the scientists, which actually become government employees. This is just straight up contractors to help build the facilities. So you can see total employment uh, is going to reach about 130,000, just shy of 130,000. The official number is about 138,000. Total employment across the whole Manhattan Project is going to be about 500,000 people when all is said and done. And that's from 42 to about 46 which is significant. And this, what I like about this graph is it actually breaks it down about construction and design, operations research, more construction, right, uh, operations. So it kind of breaks it down on the construction side, not the science side, because we tend to focus on the science side and not building everything. So this is just people building stuff for the scientists and all the folks doing their hard-edged research. Here's the structure. Every government program has to have a box and wire diagram, right? And you can see it's not simplified at all. And this is the Manhattan Project, based upon the fact that the Army Corps of Engineers ha Manhattan Division, which is where the process was originally resided, uh, they wanted to give it a code name, so they didn't know what they were doing. So they just named it after the, the region, which is the Manhattan in Army Corps of Engineers region. And their big building in downtown Manhattan. So everyone thinks, oh, it just has something to do with New York, but the reality is it ends up looking like this, and it's all across the country. And they keep that name throughout because it just kind of works. In fact, at the end, this up here is the little button they give everybody that works on the project at the end, which is pretty significant. A nice streamlined organization, right? And I think this goes a long way to appreciate what Groves and Oppenheimer have to do. You have Groves up here, he has a smithering of assistance. You have PR people, but the program is ultimately a top secret program too. So how do you manage all these facilities across the country, all these scientists, all these family members, and do it in a way that you can keep this cutting edge research secret so that your enemies don't get them? And we'll come to that at the very end, by the way, because we did a pretty good job, we thought, but ultimately there were some spies in there as well. But I think you can get an appreciation for what Groves has to manage here and why he wants Oppenheimer, because as you get into facilities management with all these scientists, 
you need somebody that can work with the scientists and keep them on track because you don't want them distracted with day-to-day -day operations of like why is the electricity out today? Or you know, why is the water at Los Alamos so rusty all the time because the pipes are corroded? You want them doing their high energy research. You don't want them worrying about that. So we have a whole significant element of bureaucratic layering going on there that we have to manage. Here's the program. The first process is you need uranium-235. You have uranium-238, it's in the ground. The problem is you have to enrich it. But to enrich it, you have to be able to sustain a chain reaction, which is what this picture is, which actually happens in December 2nd, 1942. And this is the actual graph that they use to see that it's actually sustaining a chain reaction. And that's, you have Fermi here, you have Solar there, and that's their core group of characters at the University of Chicago. Chicago. It's actually done in a, uh, in a lab that's under the old football stadium which is pretty significant. It's no longer there. There's a, a monument now. I believe it's by the library right now, or where the current library is. So they actually prove that you can sustain a chain reaction, and they build, uh, this is called the pile, the famous Chicago pile. And they, they prove that you can sustain the chain reaction, and that you can enrich uranium to get enough to build an atomic bomb. The problem is you're doing it one atom at a time. And we'll talk about at the end how much... Uh, uranium you actually need for the first bomb, and it's something like you need, in fact, let me look it up, it's right here. You're gonna need 140 pounds total. So if you're building it one, if you're enriching uranium one atom time, how long is it gonna take you to build, or to generate 140 pounds? Yeah, a little longer than a couple of days, maybe longer than you have, because again, you're still racing, right? You're still worried about what the, what the Germans are doing, what the Japanese are doing, so, they start thinking about, you know, okay, we've solved a lot of the technical problems. We're starting to solve the enrichment problem. The chain reaction is not theory anymore. We can do this, but how can we generate it faster or quicker? And the problem is you, you can't because it consumes so much energy and they're going through gas diffusion and all kinds of other calutrons and things like that. You're also building the infrastructure, right? So what you're doing here is you're building, you're solving the scientific problem, the theoretical problems. Once you solve this theoretical problem, you're starting to build the infrastructure to research, sustain, and enrich uranium or those atomic particles that you need to build the bomb. Ultimately, it's going to be plutonium too. Once you have that second problem solved, then and, and again, this is all happening simultaneously. You're also solving the engineering problem. How do you weaponize it? How do you build a bomb casing? How do you make sure it's going to go off when you need it to go off? How can you design it so that it can be dropped by a bomb or put on a barge or something like that? So again, this is happening all simultaneously. And this is the problems that they're facing in 42, 43. And the program r is really only three months old. So it's kind of daunting that in three months you've solved big theoretical issues, but the problem becomes now you have the hard issues of weaponizing, you know, to figure out the engineering and the science behind it. Let's start with the problem and a solution. First problem is right here. This is one of the original designs they set up on for the first atomic bomb, which is going to be based off uranium. This is going to be the little boy. And the problem is it's going to be uranium based. The idea is it's, it's called a gun type weapon. So you have a big thing of uranium here. In fact, it's going to be about, that target's going to be 85 pounds of uranium, which is pretty dense, by the way. So you have a big kind of conical, conical sphere of uranium. You have a detonation charge here that's going to slam this into the uranium and split the atom and, you know, once you sustain the chain reaction, boom, right? 18 kilotons goes flying off, all kinds of fun stuff. But what was the problem I said about uranium? How are you generating this? One atom at a time. So how long is it going to take you to generate, you know, 85 pounds just for this versus another, you know, whatever you need for uh, 38 or 35 pounds for the, for the, for the accelerator? That's a lot of uranium. So what's happening is that they start thinking about other ideas. That if you can't use uranium because you may not have enough uranium to build it, is there another compound that you can use? And compound's probably the wrong word scientifically, but I'm a historian, so we'll go with it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll get a bunch of chemists on the YouTube saying, you're an idiot. Uh, plutonium becomes the next one. And this is where Glenn Seaborg comes into play, as does George Piskiakowski, that if you don't have uranium, Rather than splitting the atom, maybe we can squeeze plutonium because plutonium is easier to produce. We, can have, we know we're going to have more plutonium. We're producing it at Hanford. So why don't we design a second bomb just in case this one doesn't pan out? So this is a gun type where you, you essentially what you have is a sphere. You slam something into it and try to smash it. Uranium-based. The uh, fat man is 
softball size core of plutonium that's going to weigh, and this is, this, is, this is pretty staggering, it only weighs 13 and a half pounds. So you go from 85 pounds here to 13 and a half pounds, and you can do that pretty easily. And what you do around it is you build some uranium, and then you have conventional explosives, something just on the order of magnitude of, oh, about 5,000 pounds of high explosive. <laughs> a little firecracker, a little bag. And the idea with this type bomb, which is pretty significant, this one's pretty easy to figure out physically and scientifically and theoretically. This one's a bit different because the idea is you, rather than splitting it, you're going to squeeze it to the point where it splits itself. So think you have, the best analogy is you put an orange in your hand and you're going to squeeze it to the point where it's going to explode. Now what's the problem with that? Anybody know? Say that again. Even, Even explosion, right? It has to be just... It, the pressure, and again, this is, this is going to be the design right here. You have to have even pressure on all sides, right? Which is a pretty significant problem to have. So you see the work being done here on, on working through the engineering side of this. Is how do you have, how do you coordinate 5,000 pounds of high explosive to all detonate and squeeze on this softball sized pit at the exact same moment? Easy, right? And the idea is you're going to squeeze it. You're not going to squeeze it to where it's nothing. You squeeze it down to where it's about a tennis ball size. So you're going from softball size to tennis ball size. And this is going to take, oh, the better part of two and a half years to figure out. And when they test it at Trinity, because this is the design they test at Trinity, not this, because they know this is going to work theoretically. They, they run all the numbers, no problem. But the concern here is uranium. This one, though, this is cutting edge stuff. They don't know if they can get the exact timing right, what happens if you're a millisecond off here, what happens if the squeeze doesn't go right, uh, what happens if these aren't cast properly, what if the explosions don't um, produce the same effect. So there's all kinds of research and development going on at Los Alamos on this process alone. Now they're doing the engineering here too, but the stress and strain really is this because again, if you can't get the uranium and this doesn't work, what are you left with for your $2 billion? Yeah, buff kiss, right? Nothing. A whole lot of good old-fashioned research and science, okay? Well, the problem is we'll, we tend to think about all these scientists and engineers and chemists and physicists doing this work, but the reality is the war's going on. The war's still raging, th th so there's constant pressure by Groves, by Bush saying, hey, guys, I know you're working and you're, you're, you're doing good stuff, but the reality is things are still happening. Now, ultimately, in uh, Europe, May 45, what happens? VE Day, right? So the war's over, so we don't have to worry about the Germans getting the bomb anymore. That's great, but you still have this Manhattan Project that's going on, that's consuming lots of money and they're doing cutting-edge research. So if the bomb is supposed to be originally designed to possibly be used against the Germans, the Germans are either worn out, you the decision becomes, do you stop production, do you stop your research, or do you sustain it? Yeah, you sustain it. Right, why? Yeah, you've cost sunk, right. You've already sunk a lot of money into this, right? And the war's not over yet. In fact, if you think about what's happening at Iwo Jima and Okinawa, right, that as you move closer, as the United States moves closer to the Japanese home islands, it's becoming more significant. The Japanese are fighting with more stiff resistance. Casualty numbers are going up. Can you use this thing in the Pacific? The answer is absolutely yes, so why wouldn't we continue this process? Because we're getting pretty close. But again, this is the pressure that's on the scientists all the time. The fact that they're working on cutting edge research, engineering, science, theory, but they're doing it in a pressure cooker where they have to have produce something because you want to be able to use it during the war. Nothing like a deadline, right? How are we on time? July 16, 1945, it's going to be the first test of a plutonium bomb. And this is the one where you're going to squeeze it, right? And the idea is they don't know if this is going to work. So they have the uranium bomb. That's done, ready to go. They're going to test one just to s make sure everything goes right on the evening before. So actually July 15, 1945, as they're going through the test, they figure out that you have a softball-sized pit of plutonium. But the problem becomes, as they're doing their checks, is that the tamper around it, which is composed of that 5,000 pounds of explosives, when they were pouring it and casting it, got some air bubbles. And the concern is if you have air bubbles, 
Will it affect the detonation? Will it affect the time? Will it affect the focal point of that explosion? So the scientists on the eve before get out a hand drill and start meticulously drilling out the air bubbles and filling them with liquid explosives. <laughs> Dedication to your job, right? And they're doing this in the field, by the way. So this isn't like back in the lab. I mean, they're doing this to make sure that you can have the test the next day. So they have the big long tower. What they had, this is the actual gadget that they call it. And inside of all this electronic stuff, you can see if we go back to that kind of pit, this is going to be in there. And all those wires and everything are detonators and electronic measuring devices and things like that. So once they get that all hooked up, they're going to hoist it. They're going to put a big cast around it, hoist it up to this 100-foot tower, and then they're going to detonate it. So July 16, 1945. We have successfully tested the first plutonium bomb. Fantastic. Truman is on his way to Potsdam and receives a message. Right, and this is the famous where he, he ends up uh, at Potsdam with the, the nuclear bomb in his pocket, right? And Stalin is less than impressed because Stalin already knows because there's spies there, right? But you can see the Trinity explosion here. This is, I think, a, a pretty significant overhead view, so you can see the blast wave and the detonation that it caused. These are 30 miles out, so you can see the rings the Trinity's test site. This is the fallout from the radiation in Rankin. And then this is, this kind of, this makes me laugh because the government would never let you do this today, right? Because there's safety involved. You have Oppenheimer and Groves and a whole bunch of other folks at ground zero. Oh, isn't this cool? <laughs> now, I'm sure there's lots of radiation around there. And again, they're not wearing masks or anything, right? They're just, they're, they're expecting, their, they're inspecting their work. This is pretty si significant stuff, but the idea is it's highly radioactive because you can see, you know, Rankins, things like that. But again, it's the first time it's ever been done. So Geiger counters have been used in the labs, but you don't think about this stuff because you've succeeded now, right? You've, you've built the bomb. First operational use because we're quickly running out of time. Hiroshima, August 6, uh, 1945, and some details about Hiroshima. Population is about 255,000. Uh, the bomb is going to detonate at about a height of about 1,000 feet. It's about 18 kilotons, so that's about 18,000. Um, 18 kilotons, let's put it in the frame of, of a Cold War. The smallest weapon we tend to have in the Cold War is about 20 kilotons, small warhead. So this is just smaller than that. And this is the uranium one, right? So we were able to actually produce enough uranium just in time to build one bomb, by the way. And this is it. So of that 255,000 in Hiroshima when it's dropped, initially the blast is going to kill about 66,000 initially, prompt. Uh, another 69,000 are injured for a total of about 135,000 uh, either dead and or injured. So you're looking at just roughly half the population of Hiroshima is going to be affected in some way with one bomb and one aircraft. Now, it is true that prior to the dropping of the uh, atomic bomb on Hiroshima, the United States is firebombing Tokyo. And they were killing lots of people, 350,000 total in the firebombings of Tokyo. But that's going to take time. It's multiple missions, multiple days, multiple months, things like that. This is one aircraft, one bomb, and you killed half a city, or injured casualties, half a city. And you can see Hiroshima before, Hiroshima after. The white stuff. The stuff that's been completely kind of denuded and wiped out. So you can see kind of ground zero, which is right around here, by the way, and the way it radiates out. So there's not much left of downtown Hiroshima, which is significant. The Japanese don't surrender after the first bomb, despite the fact that there are negotiations going on with the Soviets, and there's uh, internal fighting going on within the Japanese government on what to do, whether you should um, surrender or not. The second operational use is Nagasaki. Drop by a boxcar, and it's going to be that plutonium bomb that we talked about, right? The one they tested at Trinity. It's almost identical to what they tested at Trinity. The, the difference is they've now put a different casing on it because it's not for test purposes, it's for operational use. And this one has a bit of a different effect, and some of it is the geography around Nagasaki. Nagasaki has 195,000 people. The initial um, people in Nagasaki killed by the second bomb are 39,000 with another 25,000 injured. The bomb by itself is about 21 kilotons, so it's about three kilotons more than the uranium bomb. And the number of people, the number of casualties is about 64,000. So combined, Hiroshima and Nagasaki 
we're looking at about 200 and some thousand total casualties. And again, if you want to compare it to the Tokyo firebombing, a lot of people say, well, they killed more in the firebombing. Yes, but again, that's lots of aircraft, lots of days, lots of time. This is two aircraft, two bombs, and you've killed two-thirds of that in just a matter of days. After Nagasaki, essentially, and the Soviet invasion, which is going to happen, the Japanese will surrender. Questions on the bomb, because we'll come back to costs, and then we'll kind of open up the question. We have about an hour, right? Questions on the bomb so far? All right, let's look at costs. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, throughout the whole process, there are folks that are coming down with mysterious illnesses, and they're doing research on, like, the pit for plutonium. At one point uh, at Los Alamos, it starts to go critical, and the guy's tr trying to research, and he tries to reach in and pull the pit out, which isn't a good move when it's going critical. So he gets radiated and is going to end up dying of radiation poisoning. So along the way, there are folks, th they're hyper, hyperly cautious, but yet there are times when you're just you're winging the science and uh, they find out about radiation sickness and things like that firsthand. So yes. Sure. Which one? Yeah, this is before, this is after. The answer is um, about the same. Are, are you talking like blast wave and heat and things like that? The, the part of it's geography, the fact that there are mountains and things around Hiroshima, so it'll keep everything in. Nagasaki is a little more wide open, so the blast wave can go out. And won't, and, and what's interesting, if you ever watched atomic bomb tests, you can like there's been some stuff that have been declassified recently. You can see the blast wave go out. So if you have mountains surrounding you, it's going to go out, hit those mountains, and actually come back. If it's flat, it's just going to go out until it kind of dissipates and goes away. So geography plays a huge part. So if you're kind of in a bowl, it's going to have an impact, whereas in Nagasaki is a little flatter, so therefore it's going to kind of stay and just go out. Uh, what we find out, or yeah, what we find out at the end of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki is that one of the best um, substances for atomic blasts is really concrete, concrete and steel. Uh, pretty blast resistance, by the way, unless you're kind of right in ground zero. The other thing they find out is about three feet of dirt's pretty good too for at least absorbing radiation. But the problem is if you're within, if you're within the ground zero, right, a thousand <coughs> meters or so, you're going to get incinerated because ultimately you're talking about, you're talking heat that's approximately the same as the surface of the sun for a bl for an instant. So things become instantly vaporized and stuff like that. So it's a pretty horrific weapon. Um, lots of good medical research actually is going to be developed as a result of the victims of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In fact, the Japanese government does a fantastic job of tracking uh, victims, survivors, and their family throughout on the impact of this. So we actually, the world has, has gotten fantastic research, unfortunately, off these, these horrific events. The cost. And this is from the Department of Energy, and what they've done is they've kind of brought everything together from 42 to 46, because the Manhattan Project is actually going to stay online until 46, and it's going to essentially transition to the Atomic Energy Commission, who's going to then manage and build and work on U.S. atomic weapons throughout the duration of the Cold War. <coughs> and 500,000 people, as I talked about, total, include scientists, contractors, all those characters. And at the end, as I said, they all get this nice little token that we worked on the bomb, because once the bombs are detonated, those secrets we kept are no longer secret. In fact, everyone's kind of relishing in, ah, atomic, you know, the atomic age is is upon us and everyone can embrace it now, which is pretty significant. Total cost in 2014 dollars is $28 billion, which is pretty significant. Uh, the 14,700 tons of silver is being used for electromagnets, and this all comes from the Department of the Treasury, so you start smelting down your silver coins to help contribute to the bomb project, which if you think about it, that's a lot of silver, by the way, right? What's the current price of silver, anybody know? You do the math, it's a little bit of money, right? Uh, these numbers down here are ultimately designed to demonstrate, okay, the bomb in 45, what we do in 46, maintain it, and then in 2014, the cost to maintain U.S. ICBMs, uh, which are missiles, 
submarine launch ballistic missiles and then bombers and the Triad. This is the ultimately the number of warheads produced during the Cold War. So there, there's an idea that once you let this nuclear genie out of the bottle, there is a moment uh, with Bernard Baruch in the United States where we try to kind of send it through the UN that, hey, why don't we open this up to the world, you know, ban nuclear weapons because they are um, a bit different than normal bombs in many ways. The Soviets think it's a ploy, though, because they're working on their own bomb. And part of the idea of the Baroque plan is uh, if you're working on it, you have to give it up. And the Soviets think, well, we're working on it, but the United States already has it, so this is some kind of trick, so we're going to say no, which is pretty uniquely Soviet for that part. No, that's over the next 30 years, by the way, which isn't horribly expensive. I don't believe I just said that, but, you know, <laughs> you're going to maintain it for 30 years, you know? <laughs> it's just money, right? You go to the tree, right? Um, and, and there's actually a debate happening right now on whether we still need those three legs of the triad. Maybe we only need two, so stay tuned for that debate, all right? Now, we talked about secrets a little bit, right? The spies and the Soviets right at the end, that during this whole project, one of Grove's obsession is secrecy that you have to keep this stuff secret because it really is cutting edge research and we don't want to give it to our enemies. The problem is that as we start working through both the uranium gun type bomb and ultimately the plutonium bomb, we need help from allies, the Brits. The problem with some of the Brit scientists are they tend to be communists and they've been compromised by what becomes the KGB. So here's two examples, Klaus Fuchs and Theodore Hall who actually work on the Manhattan Project As at Los Alamos are actually giving copious amounts of their research to the Soviet Union. And these, I picked these two out specifically because there's, there's green, green glasses, a whole bunch of other folks that, that are uh, identified as working with the KGB as well. But these two provide a lot of engineering and R&D to the Soviets. So the fact that when the Soviets detonated their first bomb in 49, which is years before we think they can ever do it because we know how long it took us and we knew the resources it, it, it takes to do it, that we, uh, we extrapolate out that the Soviets can, can't do it possibly before at least 1952. The problem is they have all the research from these two guys. So they don't have to go on the same dead-end path. They don't have to do discovery learning. They can actually read their notes and say, oh, okay, you don't do that because that's a dead end, so let's just go this way because Fuchs and Hall has given us this significant amount of research. So in, in reality, these two spies do a significant amount of damage to the U.S. program because they give it to the Soviets, and the Soviets are able to develop a bomb much quicker than we thought they'd be able to because they have the cliff notes on how to go about it the right way. Questions or comments? Sir. Yeah, the famous phrase is, as they're ready, you can use them. So the idea is you're building them, but again, it's kind of a it's kind of an odd structure in the fact that you have to build them on. You're building different pla you're building cases in one place, you're building pits in one place, the army mechanisms in another place. When you bring them all together, you assemble them. Yes, there are bombs three and four, but it's going to take a while to get them together and assembled. But you're going to run out pretty quick. How far did the Germans get? In building a bomb. The Germans get as far as developing heavy water, which there's a commander raid in Norway where they're doing heavy water research and they're doing their atomic research. And the, the commander raid with British Jegbird teams, they actually sink the barge with all the heavy water and research on it. So it's a bomb of a fjord somewhere in Norway. The Japanese are pretty close too, by the way. They're doing some research and they get some research to the, pr to the point of we're doing, they're starting to do um, designs on how do you build the pit and the core. So the allies are, or the Axis are working on it as well. But they're nowhere near as far along because they don't have the resources to do it. It takes a huge amount of time, effort, and money to do it. Sir. I have no idea. That's a well beyond my pay grade. <laughs> I'm just a historian. Uh, the bombs they have now, are, they're not bombs, they're actually warheads. Um, I, I wouldn't be, the ones they have on the uh, ICBMs have been around for since the 80s now, by the way, and they're just constantly maintained. So we're not building new warheads, you're just maintaining them, and every, every once in a while you test them, but you don't test by lighting them off, you test through electronic simulation. Because we found out lighting them off is kind of bad for the environment. 
And people, too, by the way. The biggest problem with our current world is, is that they have built in the system right. so that people who get from their children come out and they have a small group of people. Who's that group of people? Uh, many of the labs that were actually founded under the Manhattan Project, Los Alamos, Florence Livermore, uh, are still around and they, there's a very small number of weaponeers that still work there and, and they try to keep enough to kind of maintain doing the research and what if you need to build a new warhead and there's always a debate of about 10 years. But yes, th one of the problems is okay, as you lose successive generations of folks that have grown up in the Cold War, how do you maintain that continuity, that engineering, that um, scientific knowledge? It's, it's, we'll come back. Ma'am. How long did it take them to figure out those two guys were spies and what happened to them? Um, they end up in prison, I believe, and it takes them about a year and a half from, f well, actually, yeah, the FBI is doing s what becomes the FBI, what is the FBI. They're doing, um, they're kind of probing and making sure that they are spies because we don't want to, you don't want to accuse them of being spies because it creates a sticky situation with the British, so uh, who, who are an ally. So you want to make you, you want to make solid sure that you have that you're not spies. So by '45, at the end of the war, we know they're spies and they're going to get come into. Were they I'm not sure if they were executed or not. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that, sir. For total, and we have four bombs. We've got Trinity. We've got two in Japan. You have the Soviets. Mm -hmm. I guess there are a few more that have tested. In oh, yeah, no, there's years. a there's a whole slew of tests throughout the f late 40s, 50s, even up in the 60s. Uh, well, recently too, the Chinese and the North Koreans still kind of do some tests every once in a while too. By the way, in fact, up to the 80s, the French were still testing too. Have have there ever been any uh, any nuclear weapons used in warfare, or is it besides Hiroshima besides and Nagasaki? No, no, w which is probably a good thing, <laughs> right? They were predominantly military, as a matter of fact. Uh, in fact, throughout, throughout a lot of those tests, it's part of it is let's test the design of the weapon as we miniaturize them with, with hydrogen, right, hydrogen bombs. And part of it is let's make sure humans can withstand this. So you do lots of exercises with, okay, guys, we're going to put you in that. We're not going to put you in the immediate blast range because you know what that's going to do to you. That's going to va vaporize you. We'll put you far enough in a slit trench. You know, put goggles on so we're going to detonate it. Wait for the blast wave to go over top, then you're going to feel it come back and then go over top again, and then at that point, charge the mushroom cloud. <laughs> and a lot of it is, a lot of it is morale, too. You want to make sure the soldiers are getting comfortable with the nuclear battlefield. So it's predominantly military, and the idea is you want to make sure they can fight and live on a nuclear battlefield. Sure. Hey, you can go to YouTube and type in, you know, U.S. Army nuclear tests. A and there's one kind of comical video that, that they're, they're the Army's testing air mobile um, tactics, too. So telecopters and how to move units here and there. And they're going to do it in conjunction with an atomic test. And it's, uh, it's a propaganda piece for the soldiers. So it has two soldiers kind of sitting there waiting for the test, you know, the day before. And they're talking to one another. And then the camera pans over and the chaplain says, oh, don't worry, boys, you know, this is, this is fine. The Army wouldn't let you do something that was bad for you. <laughs> You're like, all right, <laughs> interesting. And it was, the fact that it's the chaplain is even better. Ma'am, you had a question, right? How exactly were the uh, two traitors able to get their information across to the Soviets? Uh, there's any number of ways. Typically, they did what they were called dead drops. So they would just smuggle stuff out and then leave it somewhere for the Soviet handlers to pick it up and take it back to the Soviet handlers. Uh, it was 
the easiest way to do it. And the Soviets are kind of crafty that way. They do things like if you infiltrate and, you, and if you need special metallurgy, right? So they'll, they'll give anybody where like where I, white bucks or like brown bucks, right, with the crepe sole, that if you need some metallurgy and you can't get that stuff out because it's hard to do, what you do is you wear a soft sole shoe and you walk around the lab, pick up particles, and then you kind of send those back to the Soviet Union. They have particles to test you on, which is pretty unique. The Soviets were always very good at, that's the whole spy book that I'm, working on now, but they're always very good at getting the kind of technical detail they need so they don't have to run into the hurdles that we just kind of plow through because we have time and money to do it. Good question. Yes? Uh, how old were the spies? Uh, the average age is 25, and I think Theodore Hall was something like 22, and Fuchs is a little older. So, I mean, they're young people. They're a lot of them are graduate students, so they've suspended either their master's work or their Ph.D. work to go work at Los Alamos. And they're just committed communists, they believe, so. Doc, how many nukes do you think we would have had uh, when the Korean War started in 1950? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Mike, do you know what we have in the sock pile? It's significant. It's, I think 49. I want to say, I want to say, I was going to say, I was going to say, yeah, I was going to say by 50, I want to say we have maybe 100 or so, because at one point they're building a war plan, yeah, because they're building a war plan to, to target 300 Soviet cities, and they don't have enough bombs to cover that. And again, once, once we approve NSC-68 as a result of Korea, the rec main recommendation of NSC-68 is we have to go nuclear to offset conventional. Right. 49, right. It actually happens over the summer. We don't find out until early fall, right. Sir. Uh, was uh, the letter from Einstein the first indication that Roosevelt had that the uh, Nazis were working on a nuclear device, or, or was there intelligence before? There is, in, actually, there doesn't need to be intelligence. It's open source, because what Hahn and Strassman did is publicized throughout the scientific community. And Vannevar Bush is going to start feeding some of that information via his organization up to the president. But it really is Szilard and Einstein who make the push that, hey, we can use this to build a bomb, and we can't let them get it. If you think space race is the same thing, but you're racing with atomic bombs. And Other than the letter, uh, did Einstein have a role? And if uh, if not, why not? Did he just not have the expertise? Uh, well, he's the guy that comes up with the MC squared, right? So the theoretical foundation, <laughs> right? Uh, he's at Princeton doing his thing, and I'm not sure it, how he's involved or why he wasn't involved, but I know that Szilard and a few of the other guys are pretty close with him. So I'm sure he's a mentor in many ways. He's just not officially involved in the, in the Manhattan Project. Anything else? Um, I don't think, well, no, no, that's not true. There's a few that are alive. In fact, PBS just did a really good documentary called The Bomb. And one of the female chemists is still alive, and there's a few of the engineering guys. So, again, if they're 25, they're, 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 they're getting up there, but they're still pretty lucid, and they talk about the program. So there's a handful of them still left. Sir? When did the Soviets When did they aggressively start it? Uh... Let's see, right after Nagasaki. And they start ramping up. I'm, I mean, as they're kind of concluding the war, they're start, Stalin's starting to throw resources towards uh, the design and develop of their bomb. Because, again, they already have lots of research, so they're good to go. Time for one more? <laughs> or three more? We'll go with three. <laughs> There's a debate going on in the government on whether we, they should render or not. There's, there's, there's a hawk faction that's saying, no, no, no. We can still beat the Americans. If we bring them in, we can bleed them, break their will, right? Think Okinawa, but 10 times worse. Yeah. They're committed, right? Might be an interesting question. Both old Warcraft's colors red. 
Yes. Boxcars Box at uh, Wright Patterson, and then Enola Gay, of course, is at the uh, uh, right. And actually, I have a piece of um, Enola Gay in my office, by the way. Just a friend of mine, a, fr a friend of mine worked on the restoration, and, and it was a control surface that, that he was allowed to take. So one, a wedding present from a bunch of guys I went to grad school with is a signed copy of the four folks that were left from Enola Gay, and then he gave me that little piece. So, <coughs> yes. One more, right? We go. Yeah. We go two more. I, I Tom. It for yeah, and they they gobble up lots of territory too, like the Carroll Islands, right? Well, hey, I'm getting. <laughs> These are two colleagues, by the way, so I'm getting ambushed right now. And that, that gets into the whole, there was a debate about how to use the bombs prior to that, too. The idea of, do you invite the Japanese to some bikini atoll or some atoll and detonate it and demonstrate it? And the, and the problem is, with, with the, the, the fat man bomb, well, we don't know if it's going to work, so that wouldn't, you know, that, that may kind of, you know, blow up in our face, no pun intended. The other one is, do you use it in, in a tactical way, in the fact you use it to essentially soften the beachheads prior to the, the landing on the main islands. And they're thinking, yeah, no, that's not a good idea either. So you end up doing what you end up doing. Just one more. <laughs> we, we can. Mm -hmm. it, actually, the Trinity test is the fat man design. That's why in, in the, the, the plutonium bomb, the one where you're going to squeeze it together, uh, is they don't know if that's going to work because of all the physics involved. So that's why they test that at Trinity because they're, they're pretty sure if they, with the gun type bomb, the little, little boy, they can actually do that, no problem. It's the explosions at the same time, the same energy, the same squeeze. So that's why they test Trinity because once they know that works and it works once, that's the hard problem to solve. The other one's relatively easy. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.